Hello, and welcome to another Jive book review. That's when I review a book that I've read, and I think that a lot of you will get something out of it if I explain what's in it, uh, whether you read the book itself or not. Today, I'm reviewing a book by the expert in religion, John A. Grimm. This edition of his book, The Shaman, Patterns of Siberian and Ojibwe Healing, came out in 1983, so it's older than me. However, I do understand that he released later in the 90s another version of the same book with a slightly edited title, and I don't know exactly what the difference is, but I think uh, it just focuses on the Ojibwe stuff, which this book does as well. But this book tries to tie in or tie together the practices of the Native American Ojibwe people uh, with similar shamanic practices among Turkic and other Siberian peoples uh, who practice shamanism, namely the Yakut, uh, and shows them all as coming together from a common heritage. Uh, now, if he redid it and removed all the stuff about the Siberian people, it might be because, I don't know, he was under pressure not to lump Native American and Siberian peoples into one group, or maybe they thought in the early 90s that was a bit of a tenuous link. However, I think that in light of the genetic evidence of the last five to ten years, we can conclusively say that it was uh, perfectly accurate to group Siberian religions and Native American religions together, since they do come from a common origin. And um, I'll describe some of the practices in the book that he describes among the uh, Siberian and Native American peoples. And you'll notice that they also have parallels with Indo-Europeans. And of course, the Siberian peoples, the Native American people and Indo-European people share a common ancestor in the Ice Age Siberian region called by geneticists the ancient North Eurasians. So any commonalities between these three groups can quite conclusively be attributed to that race, the ancient North Eurasians. Otherwise, the only possible explanation, since they are completely separated uh, geographically and uh, temporally, the only other possible explanation would be that these practices are innate to certain types of humans and they just spontaneously emerge in different cultures independently. That uh, may be compelling to some people, but it certainly isn't plausible scientifically based on current knowledge of human beings and human cultures. Therefore, we must attribute these customs to the ancient North Eurasians. But let's come to that later and talk a bit about this book. First off, he introduces the book um, with reference to what exactly shamanism or shamanism, as some people pronounce it, is. Um, and this is a massive topic that I could just do a whole video on, and he indeed could have done a whole book on it. And it's pretty boring because the word shaman, as he writes, is a transliteration of a Tungusic word, saman or haman, which functions as both a noun and a verb. As a noun, it means one who is excited, moved, raised. As a verb, it means to know in an ecstatic manner. The Tungus are a central Siberian tribe of which many divisions can be found from the Arctic region to the Chinese frontier. Neighboring Asian tribes also have shamanic figures who are called by a variety of names, Ojuna, masculine, and Udoyan, feminine, among the Yakut, Buga and Utagan among the Mongolians, excuse me, my Mongolian is probably completely wrong pronunciation, Kam and Utugan among the Altaic, Padibe and Uduan among the Finno-Ugric, and Baxi and Duana among the Kyrgyz. He didn't say this, but the among the Sami people in Scandinavia, who are of Siberian origin, uh, they have shamanic figures who they call the Noaidi, I think is pronounced. Now, as you can see, all these different, even within the Siberian culture, there is no common word for this figure of the shaman. So anthropologists in the West, even actually pre-anthropology, the word shaman, I think, or shaman, was adopted into Western 
sort of uh, proto-anthropology really long time ago, like in the early modern period, like uh, in the 17th or 16th century. So it's been, it's got a really long history and there's no shaking the word, but um, it was originally just one people, the Tungusic people who use that word. And then it not only got applied to the similar figures in other Siberian religions, but then also to Native American religions, both North American and Latin American. And subsequently, it even get, it's been applied much more widely uh, by uh, not to refer even to a specific type of uh, religious figure, but generally to a wide range of practices that aren't particularly similar to the Siberian religious practices. And that such that even neo-pagans can call themselves shamans and i mean people retroactively apply the term shaman now to in the certain indo-european pagan religions like um and pagan priests in like germanic religion like odinic religion or even to ancient greek figures they call shamans and i think to be honest that it becomes pretty much a useless word at some point when you apply it so broadly I favour personally the limited use that Grimm has applied to the term. Uh, and But that's not to say that when you hear other people, including intellectual scholars uh, of religion, use the term, they might be using it in a more narrow or a more broad sense. Um, and uh, that is really something to watch out for when you hear people talk about shamanism, because it's also very, very associated with New Age religions. And... Uh, when it comes to new age, the the rules just chucked out the window. There's no real hard. It's just all made up, really, isn't it? So, um, anyway, let's go into how he defines it. Now, one of the reasons I really like Grimm's book is because he is very influenced by Mircea Iliada, like I am, and he draws on a book I haven't read by Iliada called Charmanism, which is probably very good. But here's a quote from that book. We must keep in mind the two essential elements of the problem. On the one hand, the ecstatic experience as such, as a primary phenomenon. On the other, the historico-religious milieu into which this ecstatic experience was destined to be incorporated, and the ideology that, in the last analysis, was to validate it. We have termed the ecstatic experience a primary phenomenon, because we see no reason whatever for regarding it as the result of a particular historical moment that is, as produced by a certain form of civilization. Rather, we would consider it fundamental in the human condition, and hence known to the whole of archaic humanity. What changed and what modified, with the different forms of culture and religion, was the interpretation and evaluation of the ecstatic experience. So, Iliada here is talking about a very broad application of the word. Actually, there's two he's talking about here, which you can decide for yourself which ones you consider more valid. One, which almost follows a Marxian kind of notion of culture including religious cultures as progressing towards a more developed and ultimate state uh, in and in that view shamanism is a primitive a more primitive form of religion than polytheistic paganism and shamanism in that view is associated with early animistic spirit worship which evolves along with the material the evolution of material culture like you know the adoption of agriculture and things like that this then inevitably according to that view evolves into a more advanced form of polytheistic paganism perhaps with formal priesthood and then that in turn evolves into monotheism and that in turn evolves into atheism the ultimate reddit king stage of history um but uh i don't believe in that and obviously eliada uh, a Platonist doesn't believe in that, but he instead calls shamanism a, a manifestation of an essential part of the human condition. And uh, that is why both these views, the, the view of Eliada and the view of the progressive, can retroactively apply the term shamanism or shamanism to religious practices from the Ice Age. And I'm not just talking about the ancient North Eurasians from whom the modern shamanic practices probably derive, but any any kind of ancient um, culture they presume to have been shamanic. And uh, that's why some cave paintings are called, uh, you know, evidence of shamanic, where it comes from Aboriginal Australian cave paintings or even from Ice Age Europe. The artwork of certain cave paintings is related to shamanism, it's claimed, even though we know nothing about the people who actually practiced that whatever religion they did practice in the Ice Age 
pretty much. But um, because there's this idea that shamanism is an innate form of religion or engagement with the divine uh, that actually manifests naturally among all all human beings. Uh, that is m more plausible to me than the progressive theory. Uh, and I think there might be something in it. Anyway, Grimm writes, the egotistical use and control of spiritual power is a constant threat to the positive contribution of the shaman to the tribe. For while such power is generally considered to be neutral by tribal peoples, the decision to use it for productive or destructive ends is the personal choice of the one who acquires it. Man cannot rest content with mere life. He must seek sacred life replete with power. That quote is from Van de Leeu in his book Religion in Essence and Manifestation. And Grimm goes on, The quest for sacred life is indeed at the heart of the human venture. The recurring contact with the numinous power gives to life a mysterious richness amidst suffering and a meaningful direction amidst ambiguity. In both tribal and technological societies, this sustaining power comes to the community through particular people, places, times and events. The shaman is such a person who communicates numinous power in a particular manner. He is thus an analogous to other religious personalities, such as the priest, prophet, yogi or sage, who find communal support because of their ability to mediate between the source of power and their own community. The shaman is likewise an ancient religious personality who transmits a special power that is efficacious in the social system. So now we get an idea of what the word is meaning in the context of the book. Now I'll come back to the distinction between other religious figures such as a priest or a yogi, a prophet or sage as defined by Grimm later because I think that's some confusion when people in neo-pagans particularly, might call themselves a priest or a shaman or not really see a distinction. Whereas I think there should be a distinction and it, uh, when we use words, it, they have to have uh, distinctions. And um, I, I like the way Grimm distinguishes the two. So where did shamanism come from? Well, Grimm attempts to define shamanism in a regional sense. Shamanism is such a compact phenomena, referring to the distribution, uh, among the Siberian tribes, though each local expression has distinct nuances. Currently, analysis of ethnographic and archaeological data ascribes the earliest shamanistic evidence to the transition period between the Neolithic and the Bronze Ages, approximately 6000 to 2000 BC. Here he is citing a book by Okladnikov called Yakutia. It may be possible, using the arguments of Carl J. Narr, Hans Findeisen and others to push back this speculative date to an even earlier Paleolithic period. Regardless of such specific dates, however, shamanism can undoubtedly be considered as early or archaic in its Siberian manifestations. Shamanism itself is not a religion, and that's an important thing to distinguish from anthropo anthropological terms. In 1894, Mikhail Vosky in his book Shamanism in Siberia and European Russia, spoke to a tribal spokesperson from the Yakut, and he specifically said the following, Shamanism is not the faith or religion of the Yakuts, but an independent set of actions which takes place in certain definite cases. Therefore, in its original application, the word should never be termed a religion. We should think of shamanism as a practice within a religion and the religion can exist without the shaman uh, in other ways not everyone becomes a shaman not everyone makes use of the shaman the shaman is not essential to the religious worldview but is an important figure within their religious worldview upon whom many depend for various medical and spiritual needs. The days of an open and free internet are over. Global corporations and shadowy government organizations are monitoring you online and harvesting your data. Your online privacy is your responsibility. That's why I recommend you use a VPN, like today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. A single subscription helps you to protect your online privacy across all your devices, and they offer apps for loads of platforms, from Android and iOS phones to Windows, Linux, and Mac computers, and even smart TVs and games consoles. It's also an essential tool if you live in one of the many countries in the world in which websites like BitChute are censored by the government. 
You just open Surfshark, select a country that doesn't block the website, click it, and you can access it as normal. Surfshark VPN secures your data by using uncrackable encryption and the most secure VPN protocols. It provides IP and DNS leak protection so that nobody can find where you're connecting from. It maintains a strict no logs policy. There's a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving it a try. Use the promo code Survive the Jive for 83% off, and as a holiday special, you get four extra months for free. When we look at the cosmology of the religions of Siberian peoples who practice shamanism, we find some very interesting commonalities with each other and also with Indo-Europeans. So the Olonkhosut sing of three worlds, the upper world or heaven, the middle world or earth, and the lower or underworld. The epic's emphasis, however, is on the earth, which is the beautiful middle region. They say the expanse across is unknowable, a broad and radiant country. The distance is unknowable, a limitless prospect of earth. No shadows are visible, bright lakes. The milky lakes are covered with foam. The soil there is curds, the salt flat stores of milk, the black boulders, oil with sour milk, the forest lakes of butter, the mountains of intestinal fat, the cliffs of lard. There is no winter, but summer feigns forever in that country. There are no nights, but bright day stands always in that country. The sun never sets there, nor is the moon extinguished. The idealized images of a pristine earth are vibrant in that description. Moreover, this middle earth is not seen as the playground of catonic spirits or ethereal gods. Instead, the lively images are all supportive of human needs and endeavors. Human needs in hunter-gatherer society means lots of fat, hence the mountains of lard and butter. The moment and manner of creation remains a mystery but it is apparent that the Middle Earth itself is considered a blessing for humans. Located at the center of the Yakut cosmology is the Tree of Life. This sacred tree unites the three worlds of the Yakut Olonko. Its roots reach down into the cold and filth of the underworld and bend back to the local spirits of the Earth. The trunk is firmly established in the Middle Earth, while the branches rise up through tears of heavens to the Yakut High Gods. The cosmic tree symbolizes the flow of energy which sustains life on the Middle Earth. Now citing A.P. Okladnikov, uh, Yakutia, it says, Nourished with the juices of this tree, bathing in its enlivening flow, the weak grow strong. They grow, the small filled out, the sickly were made whole. Such was the promise of that for the happiness of the living created. Blessing, regal tree. Now, even those with only a cursory understanding of Indo-European religion will recognize elements from Indo-European religion here. Um, I highly recommend an essay by Eric Dodge of the University of Texas at Austin called Orpheus Odin and the Indo-European Underworld, a response to Bruce Lincoln's article Waters of Memory, Waters of Forgetfulness, uh, published in 2020. Uh, that's the Dodge article, not the Lincoln one, which is from the 80s. So Dodge reassesses earlier comparative religious um, uh, attempts by Lincoln to reconstruct the view of the underworld and the afterlife in the European religion. And anyway, without reference to any Siberian sources, he comes up with a, uh, a very fascinating vision of um, a central world pillar, a tree, the roots of which lie in the underworld, next to a well of memory, kind of like Mimir's well. There are other waters in the there are waters in the underworld in all in Indo-European conceptions, rivers sometimes, otherwise seas, but there are always these waters. And then this, the tree stretches up to heaven, um, through Middle Earth and into the heavens. The tree in the Germanic cosmology is obviously an ash. In the Greek, it is a cypress. Uh, but it always has its roots in the underworld, just like the Siberian one. Uh, and you see similar, this Yakuta from East Siberia, but you can see, um, I'm in Manchuria in that region, but you can see similar beliefs among Native Americans. So I would say quite confidently that this idea of a world tree with its roots in the underworld and a cosmology of a world divided essentially into three parts, a heaven, a middle earth and a hell, which we're still familiar with in Christian cosmology to some extent, 
uh, that probably goes right back to the Ice Age and to the ancient North Eurasians. Isn't that fascinating that this this so so widespread, so ancient, and so um, common to all these different uh, religions? It, it could be reconstructed using um, comparative mythology. Uh, but yeah, do check out the essay I said, Orpheus, Odin, and the Indo-European Underworld. Uh, however, today I'm just going to talk about the shamanic Siberian religions and uh, Siberian-derived religions of the Americas. One feature that I'm sure anyone who's heard the, the name shaman will uh, recognize about shamanism is a drum. The drum is of central importance to many tribes which practice shamanism. Grimm writes, the drum becomes the insistent voice of the accomplished shaman, who, on the one hand, has intercourse with powerful supernaturals, and on the other, speaks of the ills that weaken his tribe. Thus, in Sagai shamanism, the reviving of the drum reenacts the transformative experience of shamanic healing. Just as the patient's original vigor is renewed, so also is the drum invested with its unique energy. As Rudolf Otto wrote, let us call the faculty of whatever sort it may be, of genuinely cognizing and recognizing the holy in its appearance, the faculty of divination. The shaman's function is not only to heal, but also to evoke the power to discern the meaning of particular tribal events. The drum is used by the shaman at each of these healing or divinatory ceremonies, for the drum has a central role in creating the transformative mood for the patient and the shaman. The repetitive beat of the drum affects the passage into the numinous world. In discussing ceremonial events in which instruments are used to establish contact with the spirits, Rodney Needham observes, What is it that these events have in common? Obviously, that they are rites de passage, rites of passage. In other words, the class of noisemakers is associated with the formal passage from one status or condition to another. Once again, though, I am not saying that such rites cannot be accomplished without percussive noisemakers, or that only such devices are used to mark them, but simply that there is a constant and immediately recognisable association between the type of sound and the type of rite. What I am proposing, namely, is that there is a significant connection between percussion and transition. Elsewhere in the book, it also talks about, uh, I can't remember which tribe, I think it's the Ojibwe, but uh, possibly the Yakut, but um, other tribes are mentioned, where the creation of the drum itself is of significant importance to the initiation of a shaman. And that will vary from tribe to tribe. Sometimes you can see uh, old pictures from um, Victorian times, black and white pictures of ancient shamans with enormous drums and other tribes have much smaller ones, but they always comprise of a uh, skin drum, skin stretched over uh, a piece of wood. Sometimes uh, a bent piece of bone or wood uh, curved into a, a certain shape or other times a hollowed out trunk and the sourcing of it. Sometimes it had to be from a tree that had been struck by lightning or something extraordinary like that. So there was a, a connection between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm at the point where the drum was created. And the drum brings forth these numinous forces, these spirits into this world for the purposes of the shaman's ritual healing, perhaps. He may invoke these spirits and channel them into him or to, into the patient in order to relieve them of some malady, or it may be something else, it may be some initiatic rite, uh, but the drum is is vital in that, and you see that in many Native American tribes, as well as shamanic uh, peoples uh, in, in Siberia. They're also accompanied by specific chants. Uh, sometimes the drum isn't used, as was said in the, in the quote uh, just now from uh, Rodney Needham, the, the chanting is sometimes sufficient, uh, particularly, I suppose, among some cultures where drums aren't so easily created. Uh, perhaps the Eskimo, I don't know. But um, here's a Yakut sham shaman chant, which I rather like. Mighty bull of the earth, horse of the steppe, I, the mighty bull, bellow. I, the horse of the steppe, nay. I, the man set above all other beings. I, the man most gifted of all. I, the man created by the master, all-powerful. 
Another feature of shamanic practice, uh, which I find interesting, is the totem animal. The dodum or totem of the Ojibwe, writes John Grimm of the Native American tribe from the northern USA and uh, parts of Canada, is a mythical and psychobiological symbol of the ancestral life forces. It is expressed as an animal progenitor that comes to each tribe's persons at birth through his or her male lineage. Interesting that it's inherited specifically through the male lineage. I will maybe get on to the patriarchal um, tendencies of the Ojibwe a bit later. Tribal lore tells of the first five totemic figures who appeared to the Anish Inaubak. Since then, the Ojibwe have determined blood relationships and marriage eligibility by these totems, which have increased in number to about 21. The totem symbols promoted social cohesion among the Anishinaabe, and at the same time united disparate groups by requiring exogamous marriage. The totem also affirmed the patrilineal and corporate character of the Ojibwe bands, which have been described as atomistic. Thus the totem had both a social and a religious function. It evoked from the solitary Ojibwe family a particular clan relatedness that welded together the village bands. Totem animals are not unique to the Ojibwe, of course, we see similar things in other Native American tribes. Totem poles are very famous among the uh, in tribes of the Pacific Northwest of America, of course. Um, and we even see, of course, not dissimilar practices among the Indo-European peoples. I'm particularly thinking of the Norse belief in Fulgir, uh, kind of protective spirit, which attached to an individual at birth and can sometimes be seen in the form of an animal at birth or death. Like many other forms of religion, shamanism makes use of fasting, um, but not perhaps for the same reasons. When a Christian fasts, it's generally a kind of abstinence that brings them closer to God. Uh, abstaining from, you know, the material comforts is a way to remember that this, you know, earthly realm is, is inferior to the heavenly realm to which they truly belong. Grimm writes of the Ojibwe custom of fasting in the contact with spirit power. The initiate also receives prohibitions against certain actions or foods. These prohibitions express the will of the Manitou. Just as the vision gives the spirit a form, ritual prohibitions sustain the initial sacrificial aspect of the fast and manifest the ongoing personal relation of the Manitou and the initiate. Manitou is what the Ojibwe refer to, uh, uh, how they refer to certain spirits or gods, um, although certain members of the Ojibwe uh, object to referring to the Manitou as gods, um, possibly due to very strong Christian influence on them um, for a long time now. Uh, but the, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're the main spirits that they believe in, uh, spirits of the earth and the, and the air and whatever. Furthermore, the initial Manitou contact the continuing supportive power and the ritual prohibitions all help to elaborate the mythic identity associated with the spirit patron. The person who undergoes the vision fast experiences the same cosmological milieu that is described in the sacred legends. This participation in the religious milieu often is mediated by numerous figures from the mythologies, which are felt as real and immediate presences. The sacred legends and the events of the vision quest are narrated only at certain times and with great caution because of the thaumaturgic power that they evoke. Now, the majority of the book is really devoted to the Ojibwe people rather than a, a grand survey of all shamanic practices. It's clear that the author spent a long time with the Ojibwe specifically, and that might be part of the reason why the book was republished, uh, focusing more explicitly on the Ojibwe and uh, re removing other uh, references to other peoples. I'll talk a bit about what I learned from the book about the specific practices of the Ojibwe and their beliefs in types of Manitou and um, Medeowin. Medeowin is one type of shaman among the Ojibwe, but there are others too. And and even among the Medeowin, you can divide those types into other 
types. And one type is called Ghost Medeowin. Um, Grimm writes, The Ghost Medeowin is believed to aid the dead on his way to the western land of Nanabozho and to bring a person into the Mida society who did not go through the ceremony while he was alive. The Ghost Medeowin Lodge is oriented north to south in contrast to life Medeowin Lodges east-west. Although the origin myth still figures prominently in the ritual, talk of souls and their death roots are prominent in the elaborations of the Ghost Medeowin. While a proxy takes the place of the dead person, it is explained that the soul or aura departs from the fleshy body and wanders in its familiar habitats until it is placated and begins the dangerous journey to the ghost world. Usually little or no fee accompanies the performance of a ghost Medeowin. Larger payments imply increased ritual activity and the family is usually anxious that the dead soul reach the ghost world as quickly as possible. Therefore the fees are kept to a minimum, although the rites are much the same as in life Medeowin. The tone is more sombre, and hysteria is not uncommon when grief overcomes members of the family. The following passage suggests the uncertainty with which the recently dead are addressed by the Maida Society shaman. You are ready to leave me now. Be sure not to look back for the glance draws us with you. That's very Orphic, isn't it, from the Orphic Mystery Cults. Look straight ahead, as you were told by the chief Maida. We live here as long as we are supposed to. Never wish for us to hasten and join you, for you will find your brothers there, and your mother, father, and grandparents there also. Do not trouble us. We will do all you requested before you died. The shaman encourages the dead soul to join his ancestors, and not to long for his living relatives. He helps to mitigate the grief of the family by ritually assisting the soul into the land of the ghosts. Very, very interesting to me. Um, especially the north-south orientation of the dead, in Indo-European religions, north is often the direction of the dead, of hell, uh, also in Finnic. So you could argue that isn't actually an Indo-European origin originally, I don't know, because Germanic pagans believe that hell and the, un the underworld hell uh, is in the north, uh, and the south is more the land of the living. The same belief is among Finnic pagans, Finnish pagans, and their neighbours, so maybe the Germanic pagans were influenced by Finnish peoples, and hence you can see why a Siberian practice found among Native Americans is also found among Germanics. But it could go even further back to ancient North Eurasians. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but it's still fascinating correspondence. So the Medeowin and uh, Meda society is a kind of shaman, but it's also a tribal unifier. Grimm says, the Medeowin respond to their contact with the colonial peoples, mainly first the French and later the English, uh, and the associated historical crisis by providing a trans-individual, trans-clan vision focusing on the primordial ancestors common to all the proto-Ojibwe bands. Medeowin was not expressly a vision of future tribal unity, but rather a vision of the tribal heritage, guided by the Manitou and transmitting shamanistic healing power. Thus, Medeowin revitalized the shamanic ethos of the Ojibwe and provided a justification for future movements. In their interpretation of the 17th century crises, that's when uh, in the Ojibwe world there were many migrations, they, were, they had to move around a lot, uh, not directly because the um, whites moved them off their lands, rather because uh, the whites came into conflict with other Indians who moved into the Ojibwe lands and forced the Ojibwe from their lands. So it was an indirect uh, effect of, of colonial influence. In their interpretation of these crises, the Mida society shamans brought about a new understanding of the Ojibwe people's relation to their cosmology. So what he's saying is that there was uh, there's a political aspect uh, and an ethnic un unifying aspect to the religious institution of the Mida society. Um, and I find that very interesting because you don't necessarily see that among the universalist and uh, Abrahamic style religions but among pagans the that the religious institutions often have an ethno uh, ethnic function an ethnic a unifying function where formerly disparate but related cultural groups like tribes can unify under a common religious heritage or, or an institution of um, a religious institution in this case the Meda society and a 
origin, a common origin myth and a migration myth is used as an ethnic unifier to strengthen ethnic identity uh, in the face of a crisis. Uh, very interesting. And I wonder whether some of the uh, narratives of migrations and origins for the Anglo-Saxons, which were sacralized uh, by integrating religious figures like Hengist and Horsa, the sons of Woden, the great god, into the migration narrative to Britain was a response to similar crises within uh, the British Isles of Germanic peoples who were loosely related Germanic peoples were able to consolidate an identity by sacralizing the migration event of history in, uh, in and incorporating into a mythological context, uh, probably with the aid of institutions of religious authority within the pagan customs of the Anglo-Saxons. So uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, in action in the modern era among Native Americans. He, here's a nice description of uh, an Ojibwe shaman. The tribe's shamans are special individuals who have deepened their dream and vision experiences of the cosmic forces by extensive learning and solitary meditation. The Ojibwe shaman's personality, actions and artifacts must be interpreted within the framework of the tribal cosmology, which explains the shaman's use of cosmic symbolism. Four characteristic elements in the Ojibwe cosmology that are prominent in the tribe's shamanic expressions are the multi-layered universe, the axis of the universe often symbolized as a cedar tree. We've got the world tree, it's a cedar for the Ojibwe. The meditation of the Manitou and the character of Nanaboso. Nanaboso, by the way, is a deeply Odinic figure. It, it's... Uh, quite striking how similar to Odin he is in some ways. I'll come to that in a bit. But the world tree, in this case a cedar, is also of course so similar to Yggdrasil, the ash of the Germanic religion. Um, and also within their religion, unlike any Indo-European religion, the drum, which is so important for the shamanic practices, as, I, as I've already explained, was seen as the world tree. It became a symbol of this world tree. Grimm writes, the shaman's drum representing the mythic cedar tree becomes the cosmic axis that penetrates the mysterious regions and provides a path for the solicited healing power. The drum itself and by extension the family shaman who sounds it becomes the very axis of power that reveals the universe to an otherwise isolated individual. So that's really fascinating way of understanding the function of a ritual drum in a shamanic ritual. I'm going to relate pretty much everything in this to my understanding of Indo-European religions because that's why it's interesting to me. For those who aren't familiar with this channel, the focus is usually Indo-European religions. I don't normally talk about non-European peoples except in relation to Indo-European peoples. So I'm just um, going to keep on relating it back to what I understand of it. And there's so much to relate back to it here. Going back to this Odinic figure, Nanaboso, among the Ojibwe people, he's a trickster. Uh, in that sense, a bit like Loki, but he's an enemy of the Manitou, the spirits which the shaman must invoke in order to harness their power for the benefit of his people. Ironically, the Medewin need to thank this trickster figure, Nanaboso, for their ability to harness the powers of the Manitou because it was Nanabozo who founded the Midea, Midea society, the Medeowin. Similar to Odin, Nanabozo sacrifices himself and gifts mankind with a divine power, divine knowledge. He's also a shapeshifter like Odin is although he doesn't turn himself into a snake, he turns himself into a tree trunk. Uh, he is similarly feared and loved in a complex way by the Ojibwe people. And I think that's similar to how Odin was seen. He is a giver of knowledge. He made a sacrifice for mankind. To harness this knowledge is dangerous and scary for the people. So many, as I said, shamanism isn't a religion. The shaman is a complex figure within cultures that have shamans, whereas they're, sim they're simultaneously very well respected, but also feared and sometimes despised. They're, also, they're kind of at the outskirts of society. Grimm says of Nanabozo, 
the the Ojibwe sees his actions as ultimately beneficial for humanity, of Nanabozo's actions. They feel that by causing human death, Nanabozo did indeed prevent overpopulation and depletion of the game animals. Similarly, in the first episode mentioned, Nanabozo's threat to the Manitou ironically led to the important creation of Mudewin for later humanity. The Ojibwe cosmological stories present the contradictory nature of Nanabozo as the interplay of divine and demonic elements. Nanabozo reflects the tribal view that personalistic power is both beneficial and harmful. Like Nanabozo, the Ojibwe shaman is fascinated with Manitou power. In the tribe, the visionary is described as being amused or distracted by the Manitou in an otherwise sombre and difficult world. Thus, at times, shamans escaped the rigours of the tribal hunting life and were amused by their guardian spirit's powers. The Ojibwe recognise that it is possible for a person to be overwhelmed by personalistic powers, yet they consider that the pursuit of personalistic power is a means of alleviating the inherent weakness of the human condition. The ideal personality is one who becomes so powerful that he can claim to embody the Manitou itself, like Nanabosu, who boldly pursued power and brazenly claimed equal status with the Manitou. So Nanabozo, you can see, is quite a hubristic figure who stares right in the face of the gods and demands, you know, equal status with them so that he can achieve their power. You could compare him to Prometheus, perhaps, except that he never gets any punishment like Prometheus does. Some people like to use this f phrase Promethean, uh, when I often think they would be far better off refer saying Odinic. Nanaboso's power, and that of later Ojibwe shamans, is also manifest in their sacrificial mode. In Medeowin lore, Nanaboso undergoes the first Medeowin cure. He is shot dead by the Manitou, and revived by the ceremony's medicine. By sacrificing himself, he transmits the healing rite to the later Mida society. He initiates the healing communion with the natural forces that are centred on the patient undergoing Medeowin. He is the Ojibwe prototype of the cosmic person who, in sacrificing himself, assures the continuing interrelation of power to the animate universe and restores the original communication with, with the spirit sources of that power. Medeowin is an initiation rite that was bestowed on Nanaboso, the first patient. Traditionally, Medeowin is intended to expose the patient candidate to the Manitou energies evoked by reenactment of the mythic Medeowin. This ritual reenactment is performed by a recitation of the ceremony's origin legends. In Medeowin, the individual dream validated shamans set aside their special shamanistic abilities to portray the assembled Manitou of the mythic ceremony. The patient candidate recreates the role of the cosmic person, Nanaboso who ritually died and was revived by the healing rite. The thaumaturgy of Medeowin redramatizes the cosmic person's death and rebirth and thus establishes the initiate's interconnectedness with the pers personalistic power of the universe. The pattern of the reenactment can be used to interpret the cosmological symbols in the Medeowin ritual. Reenactment is the means by which the initiating vision of the Medeowin Law is formed by the assembled shamans into a symbolic ritual. The effect of the ritual is to authenticate the tribe's cosmology and to affirm their assertive ethos. You can see there Grimm is describing a patient. Uh, what he's saying is that Nanaboto has a. That in the normal Medeowin practices, the Shaman, the shamanic ritual is often a healing practice. Someone's actually sick. And we'd be mistaken to think of this as like problem, solution, religion. Like the problem is someone is sick. The solution is a shamanic invocation of the Manitou powers. And then once they're healed, that's it. It isn't seen that way. In fact, the sickness is actually part of an initiation. And the patient is in an initiate. Being healed in a Medeowin ceremony is not just a case of getting yourself better. It's a case of being initiated into a shamanic knowledge. 
And that's what happened with Nana Bozo. He was, you know, first himself ritually healed. And the healer as well is undergoing an initiation, a transformation. When he heals, he is interacting with these divine forces. And so he is changed by the healing rite. Both the healer and the healed are transformed and they are reenacting the initial act of a cosmic person, Nanabozo, whose first sacrifice made such powers of the Manitou available to the Ojibwe people. This is, you know, very interesting phenomenon that you see similarly among other religions in the world where the sacred ritual is uh, a bringing forth of sacred time into the present so that, you know, primordial events are reenacted in the present and become eternal uh, so, such that they don't see them as having happened in the distant past, but that they're such, such that they're reoccurring events uh, during which the, the sacred is more present than ever before, than norm, in normal times. Uh, and um, you, you even become the cosmic person by being the shaman in this in this right and that's how i believe that adonic rituals would have been performed among germanic peoples uh, there would have been a transformation of a religious figure into odin uh, probably wearing a mask and that may be a lot to do with why odin was called grim mask and stuff hooded one and why we see these depictions of horned masks being worn uh, i think that is what you're seeing there is a religious figure, not dissimilar to a shaman, perhaps a priest of some sort, becoming Odin in a, in a rite of this very type. One of the failings of the book is that it isn't properly focused on the phenomenon of shamanism, as the title implies. It goes far too much into the anthropological details of the Ojibwe people, at the expense of the specifically shamanic practices of other Siberian peoples. Uh, and I think that's probably why the book was redone as just a book about the Ojibwe. But there is a lot of interesting stuff about the Ojibwe in here, which isn't specifically about shamanism. But some of it I, I want to read about because I just found it very interesting. Because it, so much talk of Native American religion, including uh, talking of the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe, often cast them as these sort of no, this noble savage idea that they, they embody pretty much the exact ideals that elite globalists have that like they're like one with nature and they don't believe in violence and they're all they don't believe in patriarchy and they don't believe in all these naughty things that the white man brought which is complete bollocks but the here you see a more um balanced view of of of, of their tribal ethos uh, and actually it's a based tribal ethos i respect unfortunately i i expect even today some of the Anishinaabe and Ojibwe themselves, Anishinaabe is Ojibwe, it's the same thing. Some of the Ojibwe themselves may deny uh, this stuff because they've come to um, many, I've seen it in South America as well, where Native American tribes have learned that it is to their advantage to play the role of the Indian that the white man has uh, invented of like this innocent, you know, one with nature like wouldn't hurt a fly kind of figure uh, and that way they can evoke the sympathy of liberals and um, they can benefit from that in some ways uh, but it's it's a shame because the real tribal ethos of the Ojibwe is much cooler um, here it goes the heroic personality is celebrated in the folk tales of the Ojibwe and has been documented in various ethnographic sources the following ethnographic description of an Ojibwe youth identifies those particular characteristics of aggressive individualism promoted in the tribal context. A boy's independence as a hunter comes quite early, by increasing degrees. At nine years, Albert had killed enough furs of good quality to sell to the Hudson's Bay Company. By twelve years, he had his own hunting and trapping grounds and cooked for himself. Every few days, he returned to his parents' home, bringing furs and hides for his mother and sisters to cure. He sought his father, brother and brother-in-law for a ritual hunting feast in honour of a bear he had slain, but was not yet strong enough to move alone. His family was proud of him. His sister's conventional respect for him was sharpened by the fact he was not only economically independent, in male terms, but that he was also socially independent, for he lived as a stranger in his own trapping lodge. He needed only a wife 
to be fully a man at 12 years old. Although this youth was rather exceptional, he nonetheless epitomised the ideals fostered by the Ojibwe hunting ethos. The notoriety of such a youth would spread among the Ojibwe people during inter-village visits. He would be extolled as an exemplar of a maturing warrior in this male-dominated society. Going on about this male dominance, uh, Grimm says, The tribal ethos of aggressive individualism is dependent upon a ritual propitiation of the Manitou. This reverent solicitation of spirit power counterbalance the assertive characteristics fostered by the ethos. For example, in approaching the Manitou during a vision fast, the docility and humility of the Ojibwe supplicant contrasts sharply with the independent behaviour idealised by the tribe. Furthermore, the hunting ethic recommended a respectful treatment of animal bones so that the animal could be reborn and hunted again. This ecologically compassionate act established a reciprocity between the hunter and the Manitou of each species, thus safeguarding the Ojibwe hunter's pursuit of game. Besides the hunting ethic, the clearest expression of the Ojibwe ethos was the aggressive individualism of the warrior. Whether the stimulus was revenge or simply the pursuit of fame, the Ojibwe heroic ethos culminated in individual honours on the warpath. The warrior's songs of bravery and his artistic badges celebrated his prowess and signalled his individual commitment to battle. In this way, he embodied the powerful qualities of his guardian spirits for assistance in battle. To summarise in my own words, what they're saying is that this is a society in which masculinity is valued and masculinity is defined by the ability to be a warrior and to kill and to pursue actively war and battle, the ability to hunt and kill animals, although there is also a certain amount of respect for the animal in the way that the animal is treated after death and how its body is disposed with and uh, dealt with, and independence from the tribe. The tribal ethos is such that men who do not depend on the tribe very much are more respected than those who do. This kind of mentality is often typified as an American, you know, a, a, as a modern American idea or ideal, isn't it? And they are always attributed to Anglo-Saxon ideas or something, but it's not uniquely Anglo-Saxon. It's something that is in many cultures, and it's basically a celebration of masculinity. Masculinity means to be independent, to, you know, make your own way in the world. The, the devaluation of individuality is a devaluation of masculinity to some extent. So I thought that was very interesting and that evoked a newfound respect for the Ojibwe people. Uh, I also really liked their view of property rights, which me as an Englishman, I have strong beliefs on. I, uh, we have the Anglo-Saxon pagans have a rune for property and the idea of property rights called Ethel, which I have tattooed upon me. Uh, and it basically means that every man has a right to his own property. The Ojibwe view is as follows. The scale of property rights is graduated thus. The absolute owner of property is the individual, regardless of sex or age. He lives most intimately with his domestic family, but does not yield his ownership rights. He shares goods with his spouse and immature children. He has sentimental ties with his bilateral family, to whom he extends courtesies respecting his property. Beyond this, he personally extends his ties in any direction he will. Throughout, the rights of the individual are stressed. That's actually an excerpt from Ojibwe Religion by Lands. Uh, in 1969, uh, which Grimm is quoting. But Grimm himself writes, the right to share or conserve economic goods is given to the individual head of the family, yet the individual is intimately tied through kinship to a larger incorporated group. Any aggressive behaviour to protect his land and animal use is not arbitrary, but set in the context of kin relations and individual prerogatives. In other words, whether or not he kills someone for their land or for trespassing on his hunting grounds depends to a large degree on uh, how closely related he is to that person. Going back to shamanism, another aspect of shamanism is the interpretation of divine visions which can occur during trances or, you know, whether, whether trances invoked from drumming or 
chanting or in some cultures the use of entheogens but the interpretation of dreams and visions is a widespread function of the shaman. Grimm writes, The sustaining values of the tribal ethos are transmitted in the Manitou dream, but the symbols and images by which these values are conveyed remain the exclusive possession of the individual. Indeed, the Ojibwe tribe's person is largely responsible for the interpretation of his own dream. The sacred dream, unlike the more ordinary dream, is not the subject of casual conversation. Such a dream represents the formal establishment of an interior teaching relationship with a Manitou patron. This new teaching or learning relationship manifests itself in the behavior of the dream recipient. Lands observed, people who received visions turned more away from simple warm relations with their kind, partly because of the new Manitou intimacy, and partly because visions had to be kept secret to conserve their power. So although I've just said that the shaman is the one that people go to to help them interpret dream visions, at the same time, at least among the Ojibwe, it's very important for the Medewin, or the shaman himself, not to uh, reveal the meaning of his own dreams. And he will often have a personal relationship with the Manitou through dream visions or other experiences, uh, shamanic experiences, that he has to invoke that experience over and over again during ritual healings and such. But he can't do so in such a way where the true meaning of these experiences, these events in his life or these divine dreams are revealed to the other people present at the ritual. And he uses techniques to conceal them because he has to invoke them at the time. So he'll maybe invoke the dream, invoke the, the, the event in his life where the divine became present by muttering under his breath uh, during the shamanic ritual. And um, that way he is invoking it so that the Manitou or the spirits will hear, but that the other people present won't understand the true meaning of his divine visions. So that ties in a bit with like mystery cults in, uh, in the ancient world, uh, in you know Rome and Greece, where it was extremely important that the actual core meaning of that mystery cult was never revealed outside of the cult. So there's a, a belief that exposing the knowledge of the gods or spirits uh, contaminates that knowledge. If it's revealed to, to the wrong people, it's only if, if, if a divine power reveals divine knowledge to you, it's your responsibility to keep that knowledge to yourself. In ancient Greece, some guy had a dream of the goddesses uh, were working as whores in a brothel. And he realized that this was, when he woke up, a vision telling him that to expose the divine mysteries of his mystery cult to the public would be like putting the goddesses to work as whores in a brothel. It would be to cheapen them. And um, I think that's an instinctive divine knowledge that you find among many cultures where they know that this kind of knowledge and wisdom is not supposed to be widely distributed or made publicly available. It's mo meant to be for an elite, um, in, in the case of the Ojibwe people, the Medewin. Here is a story and an anecdote which tells uh, a specific example of how the divine can be made manifest in an event in someone's life so that they know that they need to become a shaman, a shaman, and that they know who or what the divine patron, who their divine patron is. So there was a shaman called Hole in the Sky, and he explained his initial vision as an experience that had lasting imagistic import as well as distinct physical manifestations. He gives his own account of the event. When I was a boy of six, I was always dreaming about snakes, that wherever I went, I was being covered by them. One summer, when I was about nine, someone, in a vision, told me to strip and sit under an oak. I was just foolish enough to do that. I sat there with a cloth around my middle, Two garter snakes came near, 
then more and more, and pretty soon they were crawling all over me. You couldn't see my skin. After a while, they left, except for two, around the front of my middle, who stayed with their heads nearly meeting. I heard a voice say, You will have this until you die. So these are my two Manitous, in the body. When they get sick, I get sick. Grimm writes that by this experience, Hole in the Sky was initiated into his shamanic vocation, which was amplified in later visions and subsequent interpretations. The snakes were revealed as his source of power, which could be either destructive or creative. His mature understanding of this dream determined the manner in which he used the snake power. In his shamanizing, Hole in the Sky would draw upon the imagery of the snakes and the, phys and the physical sensation around his abdomen to evoke his Manitou patron. The presence of snakes in his body was a continual reminder of his responsibility to his shamanic vocation. Any offence against the Manitou snakes within him caused him physical illness. The Manitou here man uh, take the form of snakes in his vision. Those are his totem animals. But, um, you know, they could take other forms and... Uh, each Manitou, the snake Manitou might be a well-recognized Manitou among other shamans, but each shaman may have a different patron Manitou who assumes a different form, maybe an, an, an animalistic form. Um, and they interact with that shaman first by interpreting events in their life, in their waking life, including sicknesses. Illnesses are very important for them as initiatic stages in life and then also dreams and it might not be clear until many years after the dream or the event in their life what the meaning of it was but they are later able to piece together events in their life including sicknesses uh, fasting rituals dreams um, and such into a narrative where they're, they're thereby able to understand who or what their patron Manitou is and uh, accept the calling which is to the vocation of shamanism which many might be reluctant to undertake because it's quite an, um, a difficult path and uh, comes with certain dangers such that many of the Sh Minerwin shamans end up uh, being killed by the spirits that they invoke or, or being driven mad by them, things like that. Certainly the average Ojibwe Indian had no desire to become a shaman. They do, on the other hand, get paid to be shamans um, by the wider tribe uh, because the role of the shaman is valued sufficiently by the others, even if they fear the shaman at the same time. Uh, but they recognize the need to pay the shaman for his... Um, his services uh, and actually every pagan religion whether you know whether it involves priests or shaman there's always some kind of payment to sustain the priest who is devoted to the gods like he has to eat he has to have a house you know he has to live the amount of work they put into that is such that they're often not able to commit themselves to other vocations uh, to to a, a accumulate wealth and since their work often includes an enormous sacrifice and enormous risk to their person and it's done for the benefit of the wider tribe it is always the case that they receive donations and I think that some people in the west have problems understanding that if you've ever been to an eastern country like a buddhist or hindu temple place you'll see buddhist monks go around collecting arms and everybody just gives the money even people who aren't that you know devout in buddhism you see a monk going around collecting arms you give money if a, if a, a buddhist monk enters gets on the bus in sri lanka he doesn't pay and if he wants to sit somewhere you give up your seat he is just given everything um you give him your lunch you give him your seat you give him whatever S similar you go to a hindu temple you pay the priests you just give them money and the same was in the ancient world in ancient greece in ancient rome even in pagan cultures that don't have priesthoods, namely shamanic cultures, where the shaman is a less formal... Uh, I'll talk more about the difference between a priest and a shaman in a bit, but even shamans are paid. They have to be paid. So um, neo-pagans have 
this belief sometimes that this is like a pollution or like a corruption like it cheapens with money to, to involve to involve money and the divine it, it doesn't correspond with the reality of what uh, ancient pagan religious practices involved here's a quote on the subject the Medeowin ceremony was authorised as the reenactment of the mythic gathering of Manitou, who created the primal Medeowin. The obligation exacted of the initiate also followed a traditional pattern. A substantial fee was paid to the Manitou and distributed through their ritual representatives, the Mida Society shamans. This sacrificial act was required to ensure the powerful presence of the Manitou. So in that case, you're not just paying the shaman, you're paying the Manitou. You're giving the money to the god, or but only via his intermediate representative, which is a shaman. It is important, however, to distinguish the accomplished Mida society shaman and the Medeowin initiated patient. The status of Medeowin is accorded to both, but their understanding of the society law is very different. Yet, by gathering the required fee, the Mida society initiate enters into relation with the institutional law of Medeowin. His social position is improved, his physical well-being is healed, and his religious needs are satisfied. So in that case, what Grimm's writing about, the person who is actually um, a patient who, on whom a ritual healing is going to be performed, when he goes around gathering the fee from other people for his own healing, he is being uh, improved, his social position is improved uh, by paying the Mida society and he, he as an initiate uh, into the law is being improved and it helps him not uh, to give that money. So the same thing is in India with like Hindu stuff, when you give, and in Buddhist cultures, when you give money to a priest or a monk, you are helped by that you're relieving yourself of some karma by making merit giving money to a temple giving money to a monk giving money to a priest the same is with sacrificial offerings to gods in all pagan religions by giving them food or wealth to the god your spiritual condition is improved and the same applies when you give money to a representative of the god namely a priest uh, or, or shaman. Besides the Medeowin, there were other types of shaman among the Ojibwe, one of which is the Wabano, uh, which the French termed the black juggler shaman. Um, the Wabano, unlike the healing rituals of the Medeowin, the Wabano used erotic dances uh, and fire juggling uh, and displays like holding burning hot coals in their hands uh, as part of a non-traditional divination ritual and that was only briefly popular among the Ojibwe around 1800 although it existed before then and, and after uh, as a less popular ritual. Grimm writes the Wabano cult did not gain a lasting position in the Ojibwe tribe partly because of its frenetic trance techniques. The cult did not have the wide appeal to the various Ojibwe bands that the more mythologized Medeowin did. It also focused too exclusively on the trance as an end in itself. Spirit possession is not an acceptable shamanic technique among the Ojibwe. Their traditional shamans do not cultivate trances that result in loss of personal control. Such loss of control, because of spirit possession, is comparable to the most deadly illness conceived by the Ojibwe, namely Windigo. Uh, Windigo is a type of a monster that uh, Native Americans are afraid of. And basically it emerges because of shamans who lose control and become absorbed by or controlled by the spirits they invoke uh, and such that they become a monster, uh, a monstrous figure who hunts people in the, in the woods. Some people specifically define shamanism as the deliberate invocation of an entity so that it will possess you and you lose control and channel that you become that entity uh, and lose personal control whereas the Medellin don't believe that at all and they hate that kind of thing and that the Wabano shaman who does that is something seen very different that I didn't know 
um, that, 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 that there was this clear distinction among shamanic practicing peoples. Um, and I wonder how widespread it is in other uh, peoples of Siberian origin, because unfortunately Grimm doesn't go into that. As I say, it is a major flaw of the book is that it's far too focused on one uh, culture, which is the Ojibwe. We can compare this to the ancient Roman and Greek beliefs, where they looked very, they looked down on forms of religious expression in which the practitioners lose control or go over the top and in Rome that's actually the initial distinction between religion and superstition. Religio and superstitio. The latter, superstitio, is when you go over the top in your expressions of uh, religious uh, devotion uh, and that's why they called Christianity a, a superstition rather than religion because religion is when you do what's, uh, what you know, you practice the right as prescribed and nothing else. When you do more and you start to go over the top, especially when there's these emotional displays of, of you know, spirit possession or something like that, they call that superstition. Now, obviously, the words religion and superstition have different meanings now, and uh, that, that should be understood uh, in the English language. But uh, what I'm just pointing out is that there's this interesting distinction between a controlled and predetermined engagement with the divine uh, through... Uh, San, um, socially sanctioned rituals and an uncontrolled and chaotic invocation of either divine or telluric or whatever kind of supernatural forces which cause the practitioner to lose control of themselves. In the past I've said that one thing that distinguishes pagan religions from the Christian, particularly Protestant religions, is that the latter focuses very much on belief as being more important, whereas the former is more focused on action and ritual. What you do matters more than what you believe. However, there is an exception I've learned from reading this book, uh, particularly a quote from Paul Radin, who recorded Ojibwe practices between 1912 and 1916 when he was among them. He observed among the Winnebago and the Ojibwe, and I have reason to believe among other tribes, the efficacy of a blessing of a ceremony depended upon what the Indians called concentrating your mind upon the spirits. It was believed that the relation between man and the spirits was established by this concentration, and that no manner of care in ritualistic detail could take its place. So, here is clearly, if we have to believe Raiden, clearly among these Indians, the concentration of the mind, what happens internally, was more important than the ritual itself. And that uh, really goes uh, against some of the things I've said previously about what typifies pagan religions, where ritual is primary. Now, I do think among the Indians as well, ritual is very important. <coughs> In fact, ritual is important among all religions, including the Abrahamic ones. But the interesting thing here is that this concentration, the way that you control the thoughts within your mind, affects the behavior of the supernatural entities. Um, that's very interesting, and it reminds me of Protestant beliefs in like the, especially like the low church, where they, 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 they have to focus this intensity of belief in the Holy Spirit to manifest uh, certain events. I could even say that some of these low church Protestant things in uh, in America are, and in parts of Africa are a type of sh shamanism in a way because they channel these spirits and you get these very extraordinary performances in some of these mega megachurches. Um, but yes, this is, uh, as far as I know, not common in any pagan religion, but it does remind me a bit of um, Hindu and Buddhist techniques of concentration and meditation. So in that sense, it isn't entirely uh, limited to Abrahamic Protestant religion, rather, and to these Indian tribes. So perhaps such things were more widespread than I uh, that indicated previously. Um, <clears throat> certainly, I think that there's a lot of value in concentrating the mind on a specific uh, thing in order to uh, aff affect a certain outcome. Now, earlier I said I would try to distinguish the shaman from other types of religious figures, such as the priest. And uh, fortunately, John A. Grimm does that quite well. He says, while the priest and the shaman are both ritualists concerned with the transmission of traditional power, 
there is a certain tension between the two in the performance of their characteristic roles. For the shaman promotes the direct experience of the numinous spirits, while the priest identifies the divine presence in a traditional text or situates it in an established sacred centre. The priest promotes a religious science or theology in opposition to the shaman's predominantly intuitive explication of numinous reality. Despite those fundamental differences, however, there are marked similarities, as well as other contrasts of a religious nature, between these two religious types, because the shamans also have political, ritual and educational functions. The shaman's ability to experience directly the numinous presence and convey healing power often puts him or her in a dominant political position in traditional tribal societies. Unlike the priest, the shaman derives political religious force not from working in concert with similar religious types, but in an individual capacity. Those shamanic societies that wield considerable social influence do so because of the tribe's respect or fear of the society's individual members. Like priests, shamans revere sacred space as it is revealed in the encounter with divine presence but they do not function exclusively in one holy place. Rather, they acknowledge that numinous forces reside in a variety of spirits in different localities. The sacred place is determined subjectively by the individual shaman, who thus identifies the numinous presence for the purposes of tribal ritual activity. Unlike the priest, the shaman's communication with the divine is not by means of pre-established ritual prayers or sacrifices. Shamans create their own unique modes of addressing the Great Spirit and their spirit helpers. Although they often draw on tribal shamanic law or tradition, their methods are more frequently spontaneous and symbolically associated with the natural world. I find it very interesting because, of course, a priest is associated with a temple or a church, uh, or, whereas a shaman doesn't have uh, a temple or a church generally. He might have a special tent in which to perform certain rituals but it's not because the tent is itself a sacred space he makes it a sacred space by in, in by calling the spirits into that tent um there's also another distinction graham writes about the role of the priest and uh, as an educator so he writes shamans do not teach religious science or theology in the same way that priests convey sacred knowledge they are guides through the numinous regions and, at times, performers of rites of passage. They develop symbolic expressions to describe their passages through the mystical regions and they relate this information to the members of their tribe in ritual narrations. The religious science of the priest is more a rational mode of learning, whereby the priest educates to achieve intellectual awareness of the transcendent deity. In conclusion, the most significant distinction between the priest and the shaman is that the priest is one who performs a traditional sacrifice based upon an acknowledged scripture or ritual formula, while the shaman is more spontaneous and less bound by tradition. Relying not on a verbal scripture or established theology, the shaman creates a personal, symbolic mode of sacrifice. The sacrificial element in shamanism is not part of a pre-established rite as it is in priestly traditions. The ritual arises from the shaman himself. It's quite clear from this why shamanism is so popular among neo-pagans. Because paganism has always, all the types of paganism have always relied on the ancient law passed down in oral form or in written form and the, the very intricate rites associated with that law and the mythologies, uh, usually from you know, generation to generation in a, in a priestly caste, but even when not in a priestly caste, through uh, very thorough educational institutions as the Druids had, which required, you know, up to 20 years of thorough training and study uh, to be initiated. Of course, re-establishing these institutions is very, very difficult uh, because the law that defined them is mostly lost and we try to reconstruct it. Whereas a shaman or shaman engages directly with the divine. He doesn't need an institution to train him up. He is trained by the divine forces directly and he interprets them uh, directly himself. 
and uh, he uses a lot of intuition, which is what a lot of neo-pagans do. So in that sense, it's perfectly understandable why sh shamanism is so popular, even though it could be argued that the inclusion of shamanic activities in uh, European paganism is incongruous, uh, certainly in some cases, although perhaps not so incongruous in Germanic religion, where we are aware that there was uh, sustained contact with the Laps, who are Siberian pe people of Siberian origin who practiced shamanism, and that that shamanism may have influenced Germanic religion, at least in Scandinavia, if not in the entire Germanic world. I shall finish with this final quote, which is actually um, from a caribou Eskimo, um, as related by Knud Rasmussen in his Observations on the Intellectual Culture of the Hudson Bay Eskimos, written in 1930. The Eskimo said, A real shaman does not jump about the floor and do tricks, nor does he seek by the aid of darkness, by putting out the lamps, to make the minds of his neighbours uneasy. For myself, I do not think I know much, but I do not think that wisdom or knowledge about things that are hidden can be sought in this manner. True wisdom is only to be found far away from people, out in the great solitude, and is not found in play, but only through suffering. Solitude and suffering open the human mind, and therefore a shaman must seek his wisdom there. Do take a look at some of my other videos on ancient Indo-European religions, genetics and folk customs if you want to learn more. And don't forget to hit subscribe and the notifications bell. You can also access exclusive private videos which I make just for patrons if you sign up for either Patreon or Subscribestar for as little as the price of a pint per month. The links for these are in the description. If you support me, you will be ensuring this channel continues to survive and celebrate ancient European history for years to come. So thank you so much.